All right. Well, like I say, this afternoon we're going to talk about hand planes, uh, buying them, rebuilding them, and making them work for you. Uh, hand planes are just one of those real joys in a shop. Uh, they're they're quiet. They're not very messy. Uh, they tear the heck out of your boards. They make you sweat a lot. <laughs> no, they can. They can. Uh, they can be a, r a real problem as well as just a real benefit. But that photo that you're seeing with those beautiful shavings, there's just nothing better. It's one of those pure joys in the woodworking shop is to grab a well-tuned hand plane and take one of those really nice little shavings and the sound of it, uh, the feel of it, and the finished product is just, it's just wonderful. There's really nothing else like it in the shop. So that's what we're going to talk about is rebuilding one of these. And, and the Bailey planes, you know, a lot of people say, oh, the Stanley planes are okay. But if you want a good Stanley plane, you really have to go with the Bedrock plane, the 60 series, 604, 603, 57, whatever. No, you don't. A Bailey plane will work just fine. Leonard Bailey is the fellow who designed and basically invented the frog. And that's what we're seeing right up in front here is the frog of the plane. And it was a way of supporting a blade and adjusting a blade for skew. In other words, back and forth in the throat of the plane so you can get level with the, with the board. The depth, it's got a depth wheel in it. And supporting the blade so you didn't get blade flex and vibration, get chatter from it. Those are really big things. I mean, the, before this, uh, the planes were all basically wooden planes where you would wedge the blade in place and you had to tap the blade around and they were tedious to set up. They worked fine, but they needed a really thick blade because they had a wooden body and a wooden body would move around. It wouldn't offer the support you could if you had an iron body behind it. Uh, but the iron body would be fixed in place, um, hard to expensive to make because cast iron is really expensive back in the early 1800s, late 1700s. And the, the machining just wasn't there to do something like this. So Leonard Bailey invented the frog, a separate piece that goes in the body of the plane. It's easy to move the blade fore and aft, easy to set your depth, and the lever is lateral adjustment. Now, his, his original frog did not have the lateral adjustment. That was an improvement that he made, uh, I guess, somewhere between Civil War and the, and the turn of the century. But it was a big deal. Uh, Stanley bought the rights to Leonard's plane, bought his patents, had him come in house and work with them. And it was a fractious union. He left and came back. And oh, it's it's a uh, it's a um, a soap opera <laughs> to read the whole thing about Leonard Bailey and the plane. But it, it is a good plane. Uh, it's the basic design for the bedrocks. It's just that the frog is designed a little different. It has more support in the body of the plane for the frog, but it was also more expensive to make and required more machining. And the, the bedrock planes were tremendously more expensive than the Bailey planes in their day. And so there weren't as many of them sold. Uh, they were harder to come by, you know, in the late uh, 20th century. That's why Tom Lee Nielsen started reproducing them. Uh, and boy, Tom pulled a coup there. He went to, to Stanley to, uh, ask for the rights to um, uh, produce the 604 or the, the Bedrock series that they hadn't produced in decades. And my understanding, at least through the, you know, the stuff that I've heard over the years, is they essentially gave him the rights to it. And then down the line, they went to produce a premium plane and he had the rights to the Bedrock plane. And there are collectors out there, there are users out there who say that the Bailey is absolutely as good as the Bedrock, and I concur. I I have great luck with my Bailey planes, but they need tune-up. They were done to a price point, and there is machining in them that uh, needs enhancement, put it that way. Uh, depending on what day of the week they were made, what the quality was of the machine tools they were using, how how experienced the person was that was machining the tools because you know these weren't machined on a cnc these were machined one at a time somebody putting uh, a piece in a jager fixture and machining and uh, so there can be problems there can be anomalies now there is one series of 
Bailey Plain that uh, is better than the rest, and that's the type 11. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But here's the the, the cutting action, a couple more of the parts. We saw the frog with um, – we'll go back. We've got the, the frog with the lateral adjuster. Excuse me. I'm getting a little pause there. We've got the frog. I, I hope you can see my cursor here. This is the frog. This supports the uh, the blade. This is your depth adjustment back here, this, this knob. That moves the blade up and down through a little anvil and stirrup right here that runs on this, moves the blade up and down. This is your lateral adjuster. And the wheel on the lateral adjuster fits in a slot on the blade and allows you to move that blade side to side. These are the screws that hold it into the body of the plane. This is your knob. This is your tote. The plane has a sole. It's got a toe, a heel, and it's got a throat or a mouth. Some people call it either. Uh, I tend to call it the throat, I guess, a lot of times. This is your blade assembly. Lever cap on the top. It's got a little lever here that locks it in place. And this is the blade with the chip breaker. And uh, the chip breaker's uh, role in life is to help roll the shavings up out of the throat of the plane. It also has this little rectangular notch in the back. That is where your depth adjustment sits so that you can move that blade back and forth. Now the lateral adjuster is adjusted in the blade and that's what that long oval hole is in the lateral adjuster is that's where the adjuster sits. It also allows you to move your uh, chip breaker along as you're using the blade. Profile, that's a nice profile that, uh, you know, some people look at it and go, well, what's that? And I look at it and I go, that's harmony in a tool. That's beauty in a tool. That's function in a tool. Uh, it's just really nice to be able to work with these. So here's what we're going to do. And this is what we can quite easily do is take an old Bailey plane and turn it into a really nice new looking Bailey plane. I typically don't go quite that extreme on the restoration. I did for a photo series just to show the startling difference before between before and after. I typically tend to leave the patination on the iron. I like that look. Um, if we go back to this, you see the patination on the side of the plane. It's not all shiny and chrome looking. It has an honest look to it. It's not rusty, cruddy or anything. It's just the metal has darkened over years from oxidation. And when I look at planes to buy, I like to see a plane that looks like the one on the right. There's no severe rusting on it. It just has an overall patination that shows that it has just suffered from benign neglect. It wasn't used as a hammer. It didn't end up sitting where water dripped on it. The toad isn't broken. The knob isn't split. Everything is intact. And what I find a lot of times you buy a plane that looks like this, that just has this overall patination to it, and sometimes they are the ones that you're going to spend the most time rebuilding because they have the most problems, internal problems. And that's probably why they look like they do is that nobody could ever get them to work right. They'd chatter and just have all kinds of problems. And they'd use it, sharpen them up, use them, set them on the shelf, and they'd go back and try to use them again. And they'd just get frustrated. They'd never really use them. They sat on a shelf someplace. Or you'll find uh, an, a lot of them with white paint across the bottom of the plane by the throat. Um, and that's because these things were used a lot for trimming doors in old houses. They had solid wood doors and they'd move around in the summer. They'd swell up and the doors would stick or the cabinet doors would stick. And invariably it was painted white uh, because houses were a little dim back a long time ago. And so they grab it and they'd plane right through the paint. Well, the paint would kind of adhere to a slightly rusty sole or even to a clean sole. And you'd have streaks of paint on the bottom of them. And they got used once or twice a year to plane doors so that they had fit. And those are the kinds of planes that I like. Um, on the other hand, once in a while you find a plane that the blade is nearly gone or it's got a replacement blade in it. Those are the ones that are nice to find too because they have been used enough that the blade has been sharpened into non-existence and a blade replaced, which means they worked okay. They were planes that were workable. But there's quite a number of them out there that were really not in good shape. So here's where we start. We go and buy our plane. Now, where do you buy a plane? eBay is my go-to. I buy, I have purchased over the years 
lots of planes on eBay. You want to make sure that you get really good photos. Um, I always chuckle if I'm looking for a plane and uh, I'll see a plane there that says, you know, it says uh, as a disclaimer, this plane is in uh, the condition shown in the photos. Analyze, you know, pay careful attention to the photos. They aren't going to do any, this is a great plane, you know, some beautiful shape. And then they take photos that are fuzzy. Like in this day and age, you can't take digital photos that are perfect. You know, these things are just crappy photos, probably real low resolution when they send them. So they're always a little bit fuzzy. Hides a lot of potential damage. I want to see photos that are crisp and clean and can be blown up without pixelation so that I can look at parts and pieces. And the people who are serious about selling these things understand that too. And of course, they're going to download the highest resolution they can get so that you can look at it carefully. And some people are real tricksters out there. You'll notice that the views of the plane are all from one side and they're oriented so you really can't see the cheek on the other side of the, the body of the plane. And boy, those are ones that I'm really skeptical about because so many times these things were used as a hammer or they were dropped and they'd take a chunk out of one side of the plane body. And so they move it around. So you really have to watch so you can see, make sure you see that other cheek um, because there are unscrupulous dealers out there. And of course, they're the ones that are going to say, pay careful attention to the photos. And there might be one photo where you can see the beginning of the cheek and then it disappears. So from that, you can surmise that the side is gone, but they aren't blatant about it. They don't put it out there. And you can also get bits of planes, planes that have been, you know, some collector or some somebody who buys and sells planes has bought planes that have had broken bodies or broken frogs or, you know, the, the pieces and they'll combine them, make a plane out of it. Well, that's OK if they combine all the same series parts. Sometimes they just kind of throw them together and boy, I shy away from those. Uh, they can be a real headache, wrong parts in the wrong planes. They're similar, but not exact the parts from generation to generation. So that's why I like the nice even patination across it. It shows that that plane has not been messed with. It hasn't been fiddled with to try to make it look better than it is. It is just the honest plane. There it is. You've got a plane that has some patination. You can get a lot of photos of it to take a look for broken totes or no, split knobs, those can be repaired, but I just as soon have them intact. Um, don't worry about rust on the bottom of the plane. I've had uh, students that have gotten all excited because they've got a plane that's got pitting on the bottom and oh my goodness, it's gonna take forever to machine that or sand that pitting off. Why did I ever buy this plane? Well, they sold corrugated bottom planes. So pitting on the bottom of the plane, is not a big deal. I just uh, give them a hard time and sell it. Well, you can load those with wax and uh, you have self-lubricating. The harder you play and the warmer the wax gets and it just keeps lubricating the bottom of the plane. Oh, you can't do that. But people get too caught up in, in cosmetics and I don't get caught up in cosmetics. I want function. And a plane that has nice overall patination is pretty much a safe one. And there are some sites, we'll talk about them, some good sites to go get information on the plane. But this is a plane blown apart. And this is where you're going to start. Um, take the rust off. You can buy navel jelly and uh, and slather it down with navel jelly. Navel jelly will change the patination some. It'll darken it a little bit, but it'll, it'll neutralize the rust and get it off there. Evapo rust. That's one of my favorites. If you saw my earlier seminar today, I've talked about evaporust. Evaporust is great stuff. Uh, it does change the patination a little bit. It'll darken uh, fresh metal. It leaves a little bit of a dark coating on it. Uh, one of the nice things is it does leave a coating. So for a while, you're you're free from flash rust on it. But it's, it's so benign. It's really safe to use, uh, non-toxic. And you just basically uh, take all the iron parts and throw them in a little ice cream bucket or something and, and pour the evaporust over it, cover it up and, and leave it be for a day or two. And it won't take excessive metal off. All it'll do is neutralize the rust. It just works with ferrous oxide. And it gets that rust out, cleans it up, 
you can take it out, you can reuse that evapo rust if it's really gunky and gritty, strain it through some cheesecloth or coffee filter or something and, and reuse it. It's good until it's gone, put it that way. It works until it's evaporated or gone. If you're doing, uh, uh, just as a sidebar, if you're doing a big surface, um, uh, use a saturated paper towel on that surface and cover it with plastic. Uh, that way you can you can get it cleaned off. You can make it work. So great stuff. But again, it does change the patination. Now there, how's that for a good ad for Coca Cola? Uh, this is one of my favorites when I want to save the patination on the tool. Um, I will take a couple liters of of uh, Coca Cola, a plastic tote with a nice fitting lid, throw the parts in, cover them with the Coca Cola and walk away from it for a week if it's really rusty a couple of days if it isn't the phosphoric acid which is the flavoring in coca-cola will dissolve the rust it'll get rid of it without taking any excessive material and without changing the patination when you take it out wash it off clean it up oil it down immediately the patination will be there the corrosion will be gone so dean uh question do you discard pitted blades since you can't get a uniform sharp edge due to the pitting. Yeah, pitted blades, uh, you know, when they're pitted on the back side, uh, if there's enough pits there that you're going to end up with a pit in uh, your sharp edge every time you sharpen it, it's not worth dealing with. If you can take enough material off the back edge that you can, the back side that you can get rid of that pitting, well, you know, the time is money or time is just time out in the shop. If you want to spend that much time taking that material off, you can. But um, typically, if it's a really rusty pitted blade, I uh, I replace it with an aftermarket blade. The aftermarket blades are good. Uh, my favorite aftermarket blade and always has been is Ron Hawk's um, blades. I find them to be very, very good. Um, Lee Valley's P PM V11 is really a, a nice quality material too. It holds a very nice edge. There's a lot of choices. There's just a lot of choices out there. So, uh, you know, cleaning them up is a good way to go and you're off and running. Uh, when I've got the rust off them, I'm going to give them a good bath with denatured alcohol. And then as soon as I've got them clean, I go over it with camellia oil. Now, camellia oil is, is an oil that everybody should have in their shops uh, camellia oil is the it's a vegetable oil squeezed from the seed of the tea plant camellia plant it's um, totally benign I and mean, they they put a little uh, uh paraffin in the camellia oil so that it doesn't uh mold and and uh, and uh, degrade too much but uh, it's still very, very non-toxic. Uh, the Japanese use it for salad dressing, minus the paraffin, of course. Uh, but it, you can use it on on uh, hand tools. You can you can literally spray it on the wood. I mean, it'll wipe off the hand tools sometimes onto the project. You can spray it on the wood, wipe off the excess, come back ten minutes later, put any finish you want on it, and it's invisible. It, uh, it will not cause you any finishing problems. That little canister to the left is a Japanese oiler for oiling the bottom of the planes. If you take that red cap off, there's a wick that consists of four parts. It's roughly uh, an inch square. And the bottom half of it, that white line uh, designates the two halves. That bottom part has cotton wadding in it and you fill it up with camellia oil. The wick dips down into that bottom part, and so the wick always has just the right amount of camellia oil on it so that you can wipe it across the bottom of your plane, oil the bottom of your plane when you're using it, and it's like putting roller bearings on the bottom of that plane. It slides over wood beautifully, just slick as can be, and uh, it it's so nice. And, and plus, it'll keep your tools from rusting. If you have severe rust, conditions in in your shop where you have uh, uh, cool nights and hot humid days where you get condensation on stuff in your shop camellia oil won't do the job of keeping that kind of rust away virtually nothing does other than keeping your tools in dry warm storage uh, you know the way to get rid of that kind of rust is to keep your tools warmer than the ambient air so uh, put them in a cabinet and put a light bulb in there to heat it up and you won't have any rust. You'll, uh, you'll avoid rust. So, but the camellia oil is really important. Now, 
I'm going to stop here before we go into the rebuild and just talk briefly about um, doing background on um, on these on these tools. It's really good to know what you're looking at when you go to buy the tools. Now, Stanley had their numbering series that goes from number one through number eight. Number one was a real little, uh, and I'm talking bench planes here. Number one was a real small, uh, I, I consider it to be a salesman sample. It was built back in the days when salesmen carried scale models of what they were selling uh, because they were, I mean, literally sometimes walking from place to place and they weren't going to carry a bunch of full-size tools. Some people contend that they were uh, children's toys or, or built for young people to use. I kind of doubt that because they would have been as expensive as a full-size Stanley plane. And that was expensive. And I can't see a lot of people buying a small plane like that for uh, a real young child whose hands would fit it okay, because the odds of it being uh, dropped and broken would be probably pretty good. And by the time the kids are old enough to be responsible with the tools, they're old enough to use a number two or a number three bench plane without any problem. So I think it was a salesman sample, but one through eight, uh, number one, like I said, tiny one, two and three are smaller uh, bench planes. Three is basically the same as a, a four, two is a little smaller. Three is just a narrower four. You got four, four and a half is just a wider number four. Those are referred to as smoothers. You have a number five, which is typically referred to as a jack plane because it's long enough to work sort of as a joiner, sort enough, short enough to work sort of as a smoother. So it's a jack of all trades and they called it jack plane. That was the most common plane produced simply because a carpenter could have that one plane in his kit and do most of the work that he needed to do on a building project, whether it was working with cabinets or trimming doors or doing rough work for the framing. Uh, he could do it with that five. A six is referred to as a four plane, F-O-R-E plane. Um, that's the first plane usually you'll use on a rough sawn board to knock down the high spots and uh, make it work. Um, and then you have seven and eight, which are both joiner planes. Uh, Mitchell, yes, where do we find the uh, oiler? Judith, it looks like you have put a link to it. Um, you can, oh, you've put a link to the camellia oil. If you go to Amazon or yeah, go on Amazon and just put uh, Japanese plain oiler, uh, you will be able to find it there. There are a number of places that carry it now. When I bought mine, uh, my first one, they were really hard to find. I got it through the Japanese woodworker, which by the way, is now owned by Rockler. So you could probably go to Rockler and find them too. Um, uh, Judith has just the first one I found with the same dispenser. Yeah, eBay is, Dean has, eBay sells it. Yeah, it's around. Uh, like I say, when I bought my first one, I got it from the Japanese woodworker because that's where I bought my camellia oil and uh, I kind of fell in love with it. And they're, they're good for more than just uh, planes and, and general oiling around the shop. Uh, I use one to uh, basically lightly oil the uh, strings on my mandolin. Uh, for uh, sliding up and down the neck of the mandolin. They won't hurt the wood and uh, they won't hurt the strings. It doesn't accumulate it, it just kind of vanishes. But anyway, uh, there is uh, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of sites online that you can find a lot of information about these planes. Um, there's one, if you Google Patrick's Blood and Gore, you'll come up with Patrick Leach's website. And I, I can never remember, superiortools.com, I think is what it is. But if you Google Patrick's blood and gore, that's easier to remember, you'll come up with his site. And in that site, he has links to different sources. And one of the sources allows you to download a spreadsheet that helps you identify the vintage of your planes. And that's really a good thing to have is that spreadsheet. Because if you're on eBay or you're looking at uh, planes at a, at a garage sale or a, an auction or a flea market, and you got that sheet along, you can identify what vintage that plane is, what type it is. We had the number one through eight, but we didn't have the types. The types were, they occurred randomly. Um, they'd be a few years before a new type would come out. And when they'd accumulated enough improvements that they decided it was really a different type, they'd give it another, another type rating. Uh, 
I like type nine through type 15 that typically goes that, 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 that covers manufacturing from, uh, I think 1908 or something like that, right up to World War II. That's the sweet spot for that, those planes. After World War II, they were okay for a couple of years, but after World War II, they realized there was really not much demand for planes anymore. We'd become a manufacturing uh, world, not a uh, craft world. And there were plenty of used planes on sale and they started decontenting the planes so that they could keep selling them cheap and that's what they were trying to do, a selling price point. I worked in a lumberyard when I was in high school in the late 60s. And uh, I was in the hardware department. I ran the hardware in the paint department. We had a, a full set from, uh, I think, from number three up to number eight, Stanley Bailey Plains. And I, in the five years that I worked there, we never sold a single one of them. Uh, we sold block planes. Those were still popular because people used them up. They dropped them. They broke them. They were still a very viable plane. But the bench planes, now nah, you could go find them, at a, you know, anywhere. You knew a neighbor that had some laying around. So uh, they were easy to find. But it is nice to know the type. And that's a whole seminar all by itself is learning about the types of planes and stuff. So just suffice it to say, go to Patrick Edwards' site, Patrick's Blood and Gore, and you'll get all kinds of information. Mitchell, you use oil instead of wax on plain soles. Yes, I do. The uh, camellia oil is non-invasive to wood. It will not cause you any woodworking problems whatsoever. Waxes can. If you get a wax that maybe has a little silicone in it or you uh, are working on a board where you grab your freshly waxed plane and run over it and the first foot or so is wiping wax off the bottom of the plane onto your board, you can end up with some problems. Um, and the uh, camellia oil is so slick on wood. It's just fun to use it. You have your oiler there and you're making passes and you notice it's dragging just a little bit. You stop, you quickly wipe across the sole a couple of times. Make sure you don't wipe into the blade, wipe you know off the back side of the blade. Wipe it a couple of times and bingo, you're back to work. You can go immediately to work. You don't have to let anything dry. You don't have to buff anything off. Uh, you can go immediately back to work and it's just slick. I use a camellia oil on my tabletops, my bandsaw, my table saw, my joiner, my planer, everything. I use camellia oil everywhere because I never have to worry about it creating a problem with my finishes. And that's just, just a huge thing. So, okay, we've talked about what to look for when you're buying planes. You know, make sure that the throat is not, uh, is not beat up. The back side of the throat towards the heel of the plane. Let me just grab a plane here for uh, an example. See, I've got a few around. Uh, if you can see this, this is the back side of the throat. This is the front side of the throat, toe side, back side. If you've got a chip back on the back side of the blade, on the tail side, don't worry about it. You've already finished cutting the wood. That's only there supporting the blade anymore. The toe side, though, on the front, that's a big deal because if you have a chip on the toe side, what it does is it it opens the throat of the plane real wide at that spot. And the toe of the plane is meant to hold the grain of the wood down to allow the blade to shear it off. Otherwise, if you didn't have a toe on the plane, the blade would dig in and it would just want to keep levering that wood up until it broke off. And that's where we get tear out is if the throat's too wide and we're working with aggressive wood and we don't have a super sharp blade, it's going to tear it out. So if you've got chips on the toe side, you don't want that. I mean, if it's a really nice plane and you really want the plane, you can epoxy those in and remachine them and they hold up really well. There is a, a, a Justice Brothers JB Products. You can find this at automotive stores. They make something called JB Weld. W-E-L-D, J-B Weld. And it's epoxy that is designed for mending metal together. And it works really well. If you've got something like that that you want to fill in, uh, say it's it's a really nice Type 11 uh, four and a half, which are pretty darn hard to find. And it's got a chip out of the front of the throat. And it's going for a reasonable price because everybody, the, all the plane folks are going, no, nah, that's, you're going to have tear out in that area. It's never going to work exactly the way you want it. Well, buy it, fill it with JB weld, file it off, and it'll work just fine. Uh, clean the, the, the iron up good with acetone first, 
put the JB weld in and that stuff really holds. I've, I've bonded stuff together that's been pretty amazing with the JB weld and it works fine. So, uh, but do your homework, decide what you want. Don't jump at the first plane out there, look around and be persistent. Just stay out there and keep looking. Set a price that you're willing to pay, put that in as your price. And if it goes above that price, there's always another plane coming down the line. So just be patient. Uh, sometimes you have to wait a while and bid on one plane of its type at a time. I wanted to get a um, a Bedrock 607 here 10 years ago or so. And I was frustrated. I kept bidding on them and they get outbid. I bid on them and I get outbid. Uh, getting close to the Christmas season, I was actually actively bidding on two of them. And I had my price point set. And obviously sales on eBay went flat right around Christmas because people were putting their money elsewhere and I won both bids. So I not only had one 607, I had two. But fortunately, our, our editor of the magazine at the time uh, had been looking for a 607 too. And I told him what happened. He said, it's mine. You know, So I sold him the extra one uh, and, uh, and no harm, no foul. So, but this is what we do. Once we've got the plane cleaned up, typically the biggest problem is the frog is not bedded into the body of the plane accurately. Now the, the frog sits in the body of the plane with the two legs on the front that you can see. I don't know if you can see my cursor here. I'm hoping you can. It's got two legs here, gap in the middle that fits over a rib that's cast in the body of the plane for strength. And then it sits across the back here. There's a saddle right back here that it sits on. And invariably what I find is one of these legs the pockets for them is not machined the same now it's easy to machine across here and get it straight easy to machine across here and get it flat and even to get these two surfaces parallel but inside the body of the plane they could machine the saddle on the back but when they machined the pockets they would have to drop the cutter down in machine to the divider lift it out come over and machine again on the other side and sometimes if the tooling wasn't right one side would be deeper than the other. And what that does is it sets up chatter in your plane because the plane is going to rest on these three points, basically. And if one of these points, it can't rest on it, it's going to flex that frog. And people go, you can flex cast iron? Yes, you can flex cast iron. It moves around. And when you're planing wood, you're putting a lot of pressure on that frog. Way down at the bottom down here, you're putting a lot of pressure on it. And if it can flex a couple thousandths of an inch is all it takes. Because what happens is it's cutting through the wood and you get into it a little anomaly, dense grain or a little switchback or something like that. And the wood on this side is a little more dense than the wood on this side. It runs into that area and it flexes that blade just minutely. The frog flexes and it basically cuts a little deeper, stops cutting, and then it snaps back to place, tears out, and immediately digs in and it flexes down in again. So you get this chatter and we've all run into it. Planing a board and you get this chatter all the way across. If it's one side or the other, most likely it's because of the frog. And a lot of the times it's because the machining on the bottom or inside the plane was not adequate. Usually the bottom of the frog is okay, but we're going to use the bottom of the frog to machine the, the body of the plane right. And what I use is I use valve grinding compound, just good old Permatex valve grinding compound, uh, which you use for grinding valves on small engines. Go to any good parts store and you can get a tube of valve grinding compound, like three, four bucks, five bucks, something like that. It's cheap. It'll last you for years. And you put a nice little bead of the grinding compound on the three points. You put it in the body of the plane, have the body of the plane in a vise so it's not going to move around. Put it in the body of the plane and very lightly start moving that fore and aft. You're just going to start working it in. You are bedding this frog into the body of the plane. You're going to modify the frog a little bit. You're going to modify the plane a little bit and you'll get it so that it's perfectly matched. That's why pretty shotguns from England work so beautifully as they they bed all the parts together so that any little anomalies are, are gone and their surfaces fit beautifully. 
makes them expensive. That's why I would make this plane expensive if you wanted to sell it, because you're going to spend some time bedding it in. And I usually work it for just a little bit. I'll, I'll uh, put some marker on the, on the uh, not, not yet, but I'll, I'll uh, bed it in. I work it just a little bit, rub it in there, and then take it out, clean off the bottom of the frog, and see where the bright spots are. If you can't tell exactly where it's wearing, put some marker on there and without any bedding compound on either one, any valve grinding compound, just put it back in, rub it back and forth a little bit and you'll see where the marker is coming off the iron. Gives you an idea of where you want to work with. But again, uh, these, whoops, these points right here are usually where you're going to see the wear because one of these is hitting before the other one is. And you just work it down until you get a nice even gray color all the way across back here and a nice even gray all the way across here. And again, if you're not sure you've got it, clean it all up, put marker on it, get it in there and rub lightly and make sure that it's taking that marker off. Once you've got that done, you've got a big part of problems with the plane taken care of because now it's bedded in there. It can't flex. It's going to work just fine. Next thing we want to do is flatten the back side of the plane. And here you can see I'm using camellia oil with the sandpaper. It's great because camellia oil won't dissolve the adhesives. It won't ruin the paper. It just lays up on top, makes a great cutting oil. It keeps your sandpaper clean. So you get really good use out of your sandpaper. I do the vast majority of my sand, of my sharpening with sandpaper on granite blocks. And camellia oil makes it work because I don't go through a lot of sandpaper. I can use that sandpaper until it's absolutely dull and then just peel it off, put fresh sandpaper on. It keeps it clean, lubes it, cuts fast. So here what I'm doing is I'm flattening the top side of the frog. And a lot of times there are problems with the machining there. Uh, one, again, we go to the front legs there. I invariably find that one front leg is a little bit lower than the other because those were machined on a, looks like they were put on a surface grinder by hand. And whoever picked them off didn't pick them up straight. They swoop, sweep them, swept them off and uh, cut one of the legs just a little bit more. Or if they had jigs, the jigs just weren't set up accurately. So again, start working it on the sandpaper. After you got it worked a little bit, clean it off and take a look and see what you what you have. And this one shows that both legs on this aren't being touched by that sandpaper. So right there is a big area of chatter. That's probably why that plane wasn't used a lot is because that blade could chatter. It wasn't supported. That was one of the things that made these frogs work is that you could use relatively thin blades and have support for them. And iron was expensive. Iron was really expensive back then. So they wanted to optimize their iron by having it supported. That's why um, the Bailey plane was so successful over wood planes. Wood planes needed cast steel blades in them that were expensive. Uh, this, it's not touching up in this area. I don't take the lateral adjuster off. I just work around the lateral adjuster on the granite. It's fine. And I don't worry about this area up there. That's just the mount for the lateral adjuster and for the depth control. It has nothing to do with the blade. It's from through the middle of the blade down to the bottom that you want to make sure is flat. Uh, because that's what supports the blade. Up here, doesn't support it anymore. It's the cutting action down here that we need to have supported. So keep working it until you get a nice even sheen all the way across. Then you know you've got the bottom of the plane, uh, the, the frog set up. So that's the majority of what you need to do with the plane. Uh, you can clean up the front of the throat a little bit. If it's got a little mix in it, take a file and draw a file through there carefully. Don't take a lot off. Just get a nice crisp line in there and you're clean. The next thing is getting the chip breaker to fit the blade. Now, when we're dealing with the blade, we want to make sure that the back side of the blade over here is absolutely flat. We only have to do it once. Flatten the bottom of the blade. Well, we might do it more than once after we've used the plane. But initially, we're going to flatten the bottom of the, of the blade. And again, we're going to do that on granite. You can use a push block to hold it down on the granite and just keep working it. If it's got some twists and bows in it, which most of them usually do, start at 120 grit and then just follow the grits through. The backside, if you get it 
uh, cleaned up to 180 grit. That's really all you need. You just need it flat on the back side here. And of course, this side, the sharp side, we're going to polish it. Not only get it flat, but we're going to polish it up to several thousand grit because that side on the back is literally reflected in your cutting edge. If you have pits or scrapes or lines or anything in the back side, that cutting edge is going to be affected by it. And no matter how highly you polish the sharp edge, that backside is always going to have those little nicks in it, which are in the edge. And then all of your work here is for nothing. So get that flat, get that polished, and then make the chip breaker fit tightly. So many times you have problems with when you start planing, the shavings get jammed between the chip breaker, back up in this area. They bunch up here. The plane stops planing. You got to take the chip breaker off, clean them off, and get back to work. Now, you're going to want a knife edge right here, basically, right in this area where the chip breaker hits the blade. Want it to happen. Okay, let's see. I'm going to check a, a chat here. Uh, Greg, when flattening the backside, does the adjusting tip get in the way? uh the back side of the frog yeah top side of the frog no you can just rotate around it you can leave it in place you don't want to take the lateral adjuster off because it's riveted on and that's a fairly fragile area on the frog and it could be real easy to break it and then you have a problem i mean the early baileys didn't have a lateral adjuster you used your thumbs for adjusting it but when you have lateral adjuster you want to use it so just rotate it around the the uh um, lateral adjuster. And like I say, that area you don't worry about. The only thing you want to make sure of is that area isn't higher than the rest of the frog, uh, keeping the uh, blade lifted off the frog. So you can determine that real quick. And again, uh, indelible marker is your best friend. Scribble on stuff and sand the scribbles off and you'll know where you're going with it. So, okay, our chip breaker, knife edge, and the back side of the chip breaker here should be polished. You want that just really slick, up to about here back you don't have to worry about it but here you want it polished you don't want any pits in it you want it to fit tight if there are pits along that edge they can disrupt the flow of the shavings they'll grab the shavings they start to bunch up and they're a problem this is a you know true scale for a rough cut if you're looking at the thickness of the blade and the chip breaker if i'm doing rough work i'm going to have the chip breaker back probably 330 seconds of an inch maybe close to an eighth of an inch back um, because I want to be able to take deep cuts and I want those thick shavings to roll up over. As I get fussier and fussier with my cuts, I'm going to move that chip breaker closer and closer and closer to the tip so that when I'm doing really fine shavings, that chip breaker is maybe a 32nd of an inch back from the, from the uh, tip. And also my throat will be open maybe a 16th of an inch maybe less for those real fine shavings and again because the the uh the throat of the plane is holding the wood down so the blade can come along and shave it off and you want those shavings to evacuate the area real quickly so if you have your chip breaker really close to that point they'll roll up real quick now they don't cause the chips to curl that's just a natural occurrence from the shavings but they will help push those shavings up out of the throat rather than just letting them accumulate um, in the throat of the plane. So how are we going to do that? This is typically what I find. Uh, chip breaker has a bend in it. Uh, chip breaker made a, a, well, the blade made a darn good chisel and so did the chip breaker. Chip breaker made a great paint can opener because of the, uh, the way it was shaped. You know, you look at this shape and man, that's just great for prying the lid off an old can of paint. And so they got twisted and beat up and they didn't fit correctly anymore so we need to flatten them out and when you clamp them together looking at the end that's what you'll see so many times so again back to our sandpaper on granite we're going to lay that chip breaker down on the granite we're going to slide the chip breaker forward notice there's no sandpaper along the edge of the granite i don't want to be grinding away on on the uh, area of the of the chip breaker that i don't need to grind away on but I have the screw in here that clamps the chip breaker to the blade. I have that screw in and I use that as a stop so I know where I'm going. So I can stay very consistent as I work side to side with that blade 
until I get a nice clean line all the way across. When I put it back together, this is what I'm going to see. It's going to be parallel from here to here. So when I clamp it tight to the blade, it's going to have even pressure all the way across. It's going to fit beautifully. The shavings are going to roll up out of it and easy to do. But again, keep light pressure on here. Keep pressure on here so that these stay parallel, these surfaces, and just work it side to side. Put a little lubrication on there, work it side to side. When you have a sixteenth of an inch wide band all the way across there that's even, you're good to go. And again, polish up the backside, make sure your shavings fly out of there really nicely, and you're set and you're ready to go. Then I just clean everything with camellia oil. I oil everything down. I want to make sure that all the parts move nicely. It's this is a machine. You don't want things to be herky-jerky. If your blade is dry on the back side and the chip breaker is dry on the top side and the frog is dry and you put this all together so it's all dry, when you use the lateral adjuster, it's not going to move smoothly. It's going to go in jerks and fits. And when you're using your lateral adjuster, what the lateral adjuster does is moves the blade around so it's parallel to the wood. Not necessarily parallel on the throat of the, of, the, of the plane, but parallel to the wood so that you're cutting the full width of the blade if possible. The biggest thing is so that your shavings are coming out of the center of the throat, not one side to the other. If your shaving is coming out of the right side of the plane body, move your lateral adjuster minutely to the right, and that will move the blade sort of to the left and pick that corner up. So you're always watching where your shavings are coming from. And you don't want to dig deep trenches with those corners. So when the shaving is coming out of the center of the plate, you know you're good to go. If it's coming out of one side or ever, move the lateral adjuster towards that side. And that'll lift that corner out of the cut. And if you've got lumpy wood that you're trying to flatten, sometimes that blade is going to be moved around where it is not parallel to the plane. But you got a lump that you have to take off. You're going to knock that down. And then as soon as the shaving moves over to the side, you're going to move the lateral adjuster and away you go. You want to be able to do this on the fly. Same thing with the depth adjustment. If you've got everything clamped down tight and all bound up, you can't do clean depth adjustments. And I'll do a depth adjustment between passes. I'll be planing. I'm doing, you know, really light passes. And now it's time to do a heavier pass. As I pull that plane back and get ready for the next stroke, I reach down with my finger and I give it just a little push to get that blade deeper. Now, if you have to retract the blade, you're going to have to retract it further than you need to go and then come at it from the downward uh, side. Because that anvil and stirrup I talked about early, there's play in that. And there's play in it against the chip breaker that keeps your depth. So you need that pressure holding the blade down. If you just back the blade out with that anvil and stirrup, it'll cut good for one or two passes until the blade pushes up and hits that anvil, and now you're not cutting deep enough. So depth, you can go directly to. Removing depth, you got to go back and then down to the depth you want. And then you're off and running. Have everything just nice and smooth. And when you're setting your frog, setting your blade in the plane for your frog, you never want, I hope you all can see this, you never want the lever cap to be really tight. Lever cap should fit in place very easily. The way you determine the depth of your lever cap or the severity of your lever cap is loosen the lever cap screw until you can put the lever down and you can move that cap around. Once you can do that, now you come back with your screwdriver and you are going to screw that screw down until it just contacts the lever cap. Once it contacts the lever cap, you give it about an eighth of a turn. And that's all you need. People put too much pressure on the lever cap and it just binds everything up. It's hard on the plane. You want enough so, of course, it's not pushing the blade around by itself, but you don't want so much that you can't, whoops, <laughs> you can't easily close the lever cap. You shouldn't have to, it should be just really easy to open and close that. Um, and that's one of the things that people do is they just get everything all bound up in those planes and then wonder why they don't work the way they want to. Okay, now we've got it all set up internally. We've got everything tuned up, oiled, it's working well. Now it's when we flatten the bottom of the plane. 
So many people, that's the first thing they do. No, that's not the first thing you do. You get everything else tuned up. You put the plane together with adequate pressure. In other words, exactly the pressure you're going to use on the blade. Just back the blade back so you're not hitting the sharp edge. But get everything exactly like it would be planing a board and then start working the bottom of the plane. And again, I'm using uh, uh, sandpaper on granite. If I'm doing a, a big plane like a number six or uh, six or seven, that's not a long enough area to work on. So I'll glue a couple of sheets of sandpaper with number 77 spray adhesive. I'll glue them to my joiner table. Nice long joiner table. Uh, you know, you can pull them off and take a little naphtha and clean off your tables and you're good to go. But it's a nice long flat surface so you can get a really nice smooth stroke as you're flattening the bottom of the plane. You don't want to be sitting there, you know, the two inch stroke. It just, you're not going to have happy results and it's going to take you forever. This is what I find so many times when I start hitting the bottom of a plane, is that the center is hollow. The whole thing is just hollow. That plane did not cut well. And this plane also had the problems with the frog. One of the reasons that plane was never used, it would have been a miserable thing, no matter how sharp you got it, it would have been miserable because it wouldn't have been holding the shavings down right here. That's the big thing. I'm not worried about it being parallel all the way across here. And I, this is not a, a plane that I'm going to be trying to join a board. I just want to get it smooth. But this area right here in front of the throat is going to be a problem because this area from here to here does not hold the wood grain down to allow the blade to shave it off adequately. So you would get chatter in here or, or tear out in here. No matter how fussy you were, if you were doing a difficult wood, thin shavings, you'd have tear out in here because you're not holding those fibers down. So we want to get it. This is the important area that we want to get flat is right around here, right in front of the throat. That's really important to get that flat. And this area, you know, once we get to the tail or once we get all the way out to the toe, I don't worry about it. I've had students, they get all upset because they can't get the entire bottom of the plane perfect. And I'll grab a piece of sandpaper or a block with sandpaper on and I sand off the corrosion and go, there, it's it's fine. You know, finish up and go back to work. And again, the surface on the bottom, if you get up to, oh, say, 600 grit sandpaper, that's everything in the world. If anything, that's really nice, maybe 400 grit even, uh, a little place for the oil to sit when you oil the bottom of your plane so it doesn't wipe it off immediately. And this is what it typically looks like when it's done. Notice there's a little bit of patination on the toe. There's patination back here. That means nothing. This is the important area right here. This is what doesn't work. Kind of from about an inch behind the toe to maybe an inch and a half or so before the heel is what's important. I mean, by the time you get back here, it, it's a moot point if it's crooked or not, as long as it doesn't hold the plane up. Up here, you have your plane firmly established on the board before it gets to the throat. You don't have to worry if that's a little bit off. So get it so that it looks like this and you're good to go. I typically, when I get it done, I ease all the edges on the plane. I'll take a nice mill bastard file and I just ease the edges. These corners in particular, I take any hard spot off the corner because if I poke a piece of wood that I'm working on, accidentally with this corner and it's nice and sharp from flattening the bottom of the plane cleaning it up it's going to make a puncture wound puncture wounds are hard to fix if it's nice and smooth it makes a dent and you can steam a dent out mitchell if lever cap has knob for tightening should i be able to adjust depth of cut without having to loosen the screw on the fly yes absolutely um if uh it's, say it's uh, like a block plane where you have a uh, knob to tighten the lever cap well it's not really a lever cap but the cap onto the blade you still want to be able to adjust your depth if you find that it moves around a little bit yeah you can give it a little more uh crank on there and and loosen it quickly to uh set your depth but any of these planes you should be able to set the depth uh without loosening your lever cap uh, Dean, do you store planes with the lever cap screws loose to lower material stress during storage? Now, my planes are always ready to go. They've got uh, all I ever have to do is set the depth. Um, I leave full pressure on everything, never had a problem. And I found planes that were so old and, and uh, patinated that 
and the lever cap was over tightened to begin with where I literally soaked the thing down with some penetrating oil to get everything loose. And I'd have to take a screwdriver to lift that lever cap open partially from um, uh, corrosion, but a lot of it was just because the last person that used it made that lever cap so bloody tight trying to overcome chatter. And it sat that way for who knows, 40, 50 years and never affected the body, the plane at all. The only time you could have problems with excessive lever cap pressure creating a problem is with a block plane because the block plane, the blade lays directly into the body of the plane. And I've found that. I've found that uh, on my block planes, uh, you really want to watch on the throat on either side of the block plane, um, make sure there aren't cracks because it can get real minute cracks right in this area on the block plane because somebody over tensioned the lever cap and left it that way for a long time and uh, the you know probably in a garage someplace heat and cool heat and cool heat and cool with all that pressure in a real tight area and the cast iron finally says fine i give up and you get little cracks in there and something you want to watch for in a block plane but uh yeah i i store my planes ready to go i i like to I'm I'm an instant gratification guy. I want to grab that plane and get to work. If I use a plane enough that it's starting to get dull at the end of the uh, the use, uh, I will pull it apart and sharpen it before I put it back because I would rather take the time at the end of the use to sharpen it than at the beginning of the use because the beginning of the use, I'm focused on what I want to do here. I don't want to destroy my focus to go sharpen a plane. I want to just get on it. And I sharpen frequently. I mean, I sharpen frequently. If that blade starts going away, and you'll tell, you, you'll know real quick if you spend time practicing planing, you'll know real quick when your uh, blade is starting to get dull. It sounds different. It feels different. As soon as it does that, stop and hone that plane blade. You don't have to go through the whole sharpening process. All you need to do is get it in a jig at the right angle, and, um, you know, you might start at 800 grit sandpaper or 1200 grit sandpaper, and you're only going to have to make two or three laps, and you're going to raise that wire edge up. Wipe that wire edge off. Now you can be egregious in your jumps. You can go to a 2000 grit. Again, a couple of laps. You're going to feel that wire edge, wipe it off, get back to work. Um, you can disassemble the plane. In other words, Take the chip breaker or the, the lever cap off, take the chip breaker off, get that blade in a jig. And I use the Lee Valley Mark II jigs because they're so quick. Get it in a jig, hone it, wipe the burr off, get it back in the plane with the lever cap and the chip breaker on in under five minutes without any problem. Uh, it's really when, when you've practiced it and you're familiar with it, you can do it in two or three minutes. And if you have your sharpening equipment close by, which I do, my sharpening equipment can be rolled around the shop. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world because if you're planing a big panel and it starts to go off a little bit, if you hone it right away, you're not going to wreck the panel and you're not going to lose your train of thought because you have your sharpening equipment right there. You literally stop, take it out, hone the blade, put it back together and get going. And there are times where I'll hone it and be setting the depth when I realize what grit did I go to? Did I finish? You know, because you're, you don't break your train of thought from your project and the sharpening becomes just a habit and you quickly hone it, put it back together and you get back to work and not losing your train of thought on a project is really important because if you come back to the wood 15 minutes later, after struggling through sharpening, you don't even remember what you're doing. And of course, the first thing you're going to do is tear out uh, your material. Um, Dean, could you please show me your um, sharpening cart? Yeah, I can. I hope you can see it here. It's right behind me. It's right here. And all it is, is it's a uh, it's an inexpensive craftsman roll around tool cabinet that I put a, a um, ash top on it. You know, you got to have some woodworking. And it's an ash top with cherry ends on it, so it looks pretty. I've got four stones on there. I have all of my sharpening equipment. In the top drawer, my sandpaper in the in the middle drawer, along with my uh, water stones and diamond stones, stuff like that, because I use all methods of sharpening. 
but uh, that thing's just great because you can roll it to wherever you need it, lock it down. It's heavy. It doesn't move around on you, and it's right there. It's ready to go. And I think I paid sixty bucks for that for that tin box. I mean, you can buy them a lot cheaper, and you can make them if you consider your time to be worth anything. And actually, even in materials, by the time you find uh, good full extension drawer guides and build all the drawers, build the cabinet, you better like doing it just for fun because uh, it's not going to save you any money. So, wow, that's a lot of information. Our hour is up, but we got through it. And uh, that's basically how you're going to tune up a bench plane. And these same theories work for any plane. You have to support the blade. You just have to. If that blade isn't perfectly supported, if it isn't honed in, things like uh, shoulder planes, uh, you know, put that abrasive on the back of the blade and just work the blade right into the shoulder plane. Make sure that it is bedded completely. Block planes, the same thing. Put the valve grinding compound in the body of the plane, use the blade, work it in. Usually on a block plane, you're going to find that the corner of the support is up on one side and you got a big gap in the middle and they chatter. Boy, you won't believe what a block plane works like when that blade is bedded thoroughly into the body. You're not going to hurt the blade. The blade's tool steel. You know, it's uh, it's not going to get eroded by that uh, valve grinding compound. The body of the plane will because it's the softer material. So that's where it's going to cut. It'll polish up the back of the blade a little bit. You'll see where it worked, but it's not going to do anything that you would even notice. Uh, Greg. When cleaning an old plane, do you affect the japanning? No, um, most of the, all of the rust preserve, uh, rust uh, removers that I use are benign to the Jap Japan planing. Um, I don't worry too much about it. That's just part of the patination. There have been planes that I've restored for people who want them, want them to look brand new. I'm not sure why I like the patination. They, they came by it honestly. Um, and then I'll just remove all the old Japanning and I cheat like crazy. I use um, Rust-Oleum Satin. Uh, it, it has the right uh, patina or the right gloss for that. And I lay in half a dozen coats as heavy as I can get away with. So it kind of blurs all the castings, uh, casting marks, just like the uh, Japanning does. Um, there are people out there that are real sincere about doing japanning and that's wonderful because it's a great way to accurately restore them but i'm always in too much of a hurry and uh the rust only works pretty good although it does take a day, a day to dry um so there we go well thank you mitchell i appreciate that greg is there a way to reduce latch in the depth adjuster no <laughs> there really isn't. Uh, I've had people try uh, TIG welding material on and machining it off. And nah, it's it's not a big deal. You get so used to that lash that it's you don't even think about compensating for it. If you've gone too deep, you just know that you're going to back out until it's not cutting and run it back down. A couple of passes with the plane, you got the depth where you want it anyway. So it's more a matter of really getting comfortable with the plane, spending a lot of time practicing. And when you practice, practice on good quality wood. I just can't stress that enough. People, you know, get a nice piece of poplar, get a nice piece of basswood, nice straight grain wood that's easy to plane. And then plane it down till you can't plane it anymore. Plane it down to a quarter of an inch thick. Buy some eight quarter and go after it. All you need is a piece about 30 inches long, eight or 10 inches wide, eight quarter and plane. Plain, 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 plain. And you will learn so much about it. If you start out with something that's nasty or, you know, say you grab some scraps off a construction site and try to plane some of that stuff, you'll never use planes again. You know, you just, but a nice piece of basswood or butternut, if you got some of that around, something that's straight grain and easy to plane and you'll love it. Then work your way up, you know, go from basswood to ash. Ash planes beautifully. And then from, go from ash to red oak and then red oak to white oak. And if you can do white oak successfully, you've you've arrived because that means you'll do maple successfully. You'll do any of the hardwoods successfully. Then you start getting into the figured wood and that's a whole new world. So, oh, well, thank you, Judith. I uh, I appreciate that. I, I love doing these seminars and uh, I love teaching people what I've learned some of it's taken me a long time to learn um, but I love passing it on Dean do you use black marker on your blades to see where 
you are sharpening them. Yeah, all the time. When I'm honing the blade, I want to know that I'm exactly where I need to be on that blade. And there are indelible markers in the top shelf of my uh, top drawer of my sharpening. And I use them all the time. I go through a lot of indelible markers. They're, they're great. Anytime you're working with metal to metal, a uh, good way to see where you're going. Uh, when I start working with wood, I scribble on them with pencils. I lay a pencil on its side. When you're hand planing, it's the quickest way to know where you're going. It's just scribble all over that piece and plane off the scribble marks. Uh, go over it again. Scribble all over it, plane off the scribble marks. When you get to card sharpening, uh, card scraping, scribble all over it, scrape off the, the, card, the pencil marks. If you're sanding, sand off the pencil marks. You'll know exactly where you are. If you have a joint that you need to trim just a little bit to make it fit, scribble all over it, and you'll know exactly where you're trimming. It's not a guess. Oh, did I get, you know, look at the shaving and say, well, I maybe didn't get it all the way. No, a pencil will tell you exactly where you're at. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming to uh, in, in join in on the seminar today. 